All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Irvish Munani, and I'm a senior software engineer um, on the OpenShift Container Engines team. Ashley. Hi. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm uh, on the same team, and I work on Podman and Builda. Um, and our talk is going to be about what's new in Podman and catch you guys up to speed on um, the things that are happening here. Um, so, uh, for people who uh, are new to Podman, um, let's just start off with what is Podman. Um, uh, so, from our uh, website, you can see that Podman is a demonless open source Linux native tool designed to make it easy to find, run, build, share, and deploy applications using OCI containers and container images. Um, so, it's kind of like a mouthful, uh, but simply put, if we go to the next slide, we can see that alias Docker equals Podman. Um, so, uh, so now you're thinking like, okay, Podman can do all these things, but now we see that alias Docker equals Podman. Why would I use Podman over Docker? Um, and then, so let's just go over some of the uh, like the key features and. Um, why somebody would use Podman over Docker. Um, so as you can see, uh, Podman can do everything that Docker to do. So Docker find, runs, builds, shares, deploys, and manages containers. Um, Docker has a CLI, has a REST API, and um, a remote option. We do as well. So everything that they can do, uh, we can do, but we think we do it better. Um, so, uh, so the things that make Podman special um, uh, are that it is demonless and rootless. So what does this mean? Um, rootless, you can run Podman as non-root. Um, this means that you don't have to give somebody access to root on your computer um, in order for them to use Podman. Uh, this increases the amount of security that you can use uh, using Podman. And if you don't want to give somebody you know, root access to your computer, um, or if something happens and and a process breaks out, they will never have root access on your computer, even um, if something bad happens. Podman is also demonless. It uses the fourth exec model, um, so there's no single point of failure. And it's uh, a lot more lightweight. You don't have a daemon sitting there hogging up like CPU cycles. Um, it's just simply fork exec, uh, no constant monitoring of what's going on on your system. Um, Podman also has an extremely active open source community uh, as of now, uh, or January 14th, so last weekish, we had 363 individual uh, contributors. And in our RC that's coming, we're releasing 4.0 soon, but in our RCs uh, that uh, we did in the past few weeks, we had around 1,136 commits, around four months of work. Uh, we have 12K stars and 1.2K forks. And you can see in just one week uh, from January 14th to uh, January 21st, we had 43 pro requests um, and 44 commits uh, from 22 authors. Um, so there's always something going on on our GitHub. And if you want to take a look or uh, pop in and say hi, feel free to do so. Um, some more stats on our, uh, on our community. Uh, this is... Um, just kind of uh, as of a few months ago, these were kind of the numbers uh, compared to some other projects in the container space, um, Moby being Docker, uh, ContainerD, and then Cryo is another project that we have that uh, that deals with containers. Um, you can see we have almost double, uh, if not triple, the uh, activity that Docker has. And if, if you want to, you know, keep updated on what's going on in the Podman world, um, we have an email list that averages around 500 members, around one message a day, seven days a week. So fairly active, a lot of discussion going on, but not enough to be very spammy to your inbox. So feel free to join if you would like. Um, and uh, as Tom said in the chat, uh, this is just Podman only. So we have other projects that kind of work with Podman like hand in hand. Um, so underlying tools like build a storage image in common um, also receive a lot of work. Um, so we just we have a very, very active community. So, um, yeah. All right. Thanks for that introduction, Ashley. Um, so as promised, we are going to go over some of the new features that have been added in Podman over the last year or so. Um, the team and community has been really hard at work enhancing Podman. And while we have added a lot of new things, I'm just going to go over some of the major ones. Uh, so the first one I would like to talk about is Generate and Play Cube. 
Um, so a pretty common use case uh, is for people to use Podman to kind of test, test or, like their workloads and then use Kubernetes to deploy them. So to make the migration easier for this, we created the generate cube and play cube commands, um, which, is, uh, which essentially uh, what generate cube does is that um, you pass in the pod or the container you want to create a Kubernetes YAML for, and it generates that for you automatically. You can just pick that cube YAML and plug it into your Kubernetes cluster and then deploy your workloads there. Um, Playcube does the uh, exact opposite of that, where uh, you bring your Kubernetes YAML from your Kubernetes cluster, and with Podman Playcube, it will create the containers and networking the volumes and stuff that are like defined in the cube YAML. So making it easy to go from Podman to Kubernetes and vice versa. Uh, we want this. We wanted this to be a viable replacement for Docker Compose, so we have continuously been enhancing uh, these two commands. Um, so one of the big things we added recently was the build flag. Uh, so we kind of got a lot of uh, requests from the community that um, they would like Podman Playcube to build the container image first before deploying the workload, uh, the containers defined in the, the YAML file. Um, so we added the build flag, uh, which basically looks for a directory with the same name as the image name that is defined in your cube YAML. Uh, and when there's a container file or Docker file under that, Playcube will first go there, build the container file, and then use that image to um, create your container workloads. Uh, since Kubernetes doesn't support this, if you want to you know, use the same Kubernetes YAML in your Kubernetes cluster, you will first have to push the image that was built locally to a registry so that Kubernetes can then go up there and pull it down to you know, um, deploy your containers. Um, the second one is we added the down flag. Uh, so basically, a cube YAML can be pretty long. You can have a lot of containers that you're creating, volumes, et cetera. And then um, cleanup can be pretty tedious if you want to, when you're done testing or you want to clean it up, right? So instead of having users go in manually cleaning up everything you know, on their own. We added this down flag, which when you um, set that and pass the YAML file that you created with Playcube, it will go through all the things that was set up, stop them, remove them, and um, so that you can have a clean environment after that. Um, one more feature we added was init containers. Um, so this is a Kubernetes concept where um, an init container is a container that runs to initialize your environment and exits before your uh, main container starts. Um, so Podman uh, took that concept and added it in here as well. So it works with Playcube and Generate Cube as well. Um, in Podman, we have uh, two different kinds. We have one shot, which means that the init container will run, exit, and it will be removed. And then we have always the init con always, which means the init container will um, run, exit, but it will stay in the it will stay in exited state in your history over there. Um, so that when you generate when you do a for example Podman Generate Cube, it will note it will it will detect that there was an init container and then add that configuration to your YAML file as well. Um, we also added some health checks um, equivalent to like the Kubernetes liveness probe and readiness probe. All right, so um, as promised, we have some demos. Let me just switch to my terminal really quickly. Uh, all right, so um, here we have, I'm gonna go over a uh, play cube with build. So here I have a simple cube YAML file, um, just a sleep command. And if you see my image name here is called my UBI8 because I want to build my own image. Um, this is what my container file under the my UBI8 um, directory looks like. Uh, fairly simple, just three steps. And then when I run Podman Playcube with the build flag, you can see here that the image was built and then committed. And then my container and pod was created from that after. So if we do look at Podman images, um, the first line here, we can see that my UBI 8 was uh, built. And then let's take a look at the containers that are up and running. Um, there are two containers running here. One is the pause container, which runs when you have a pod up. And then the second one is the my UBI container, which I had defined in my cube YAML file. Um, so now I'm done with this. I want to, you know, um, get rid of it. I'm, I'm, I just want to, so I'll just run the pod and play cube with the down flag and pass in the YAML file again. I'm not very creative with names, so I just called the playcube.yaml. <laughs> and um, when I run that, uh, you can see it said that the pod was stopped and removed. And when we look at the podman ps, uh, we have no containers up and running. Um, so that was just a quick demo on um, using uh, playcube with build and down. All right. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, our integration with system D. Um, so Podman um, embraces the power of systemd. So systemd uh, as fed one in containers is supported by default. Similar to how we have Podman generate cube, we have Podman generate systemd. So that's a command you can use to create uh, systemd unit files from your pods and containers. 
Um, so this is very useful if you want to, you know, create a, if you want to have a service that creates a container on like boot time, for example. So um, instead of you having to write it yourself, we automatically have that command that generates those. Um, we also support socket activated containers. Um, so for services that have very low traffic, there really is no need to, you know, constantly listen on a socket. Um, so when a packet actually arrives at the socket, uh, a trigger uh, a trigger is fired and pod one is activated to create the containers and processes as needed, and the socket is then passed down through the container processes. Uh, similarly, we have um, SD notify support. Uh, we pass down the notify socket to containers so that processes in the containers can use the functionality of SD notify with systemd um, to notify when it's up and ready, and the dependent processes can then you know continue as um, as created. Uh, we also have pod one auto update and auto update rollback. Uh, this is mainly a use case for like edge uh, or like IoT devices. Uh, so let's say you have thousands and thousands of devices out in the field, right? And you want to send, you want to trigger an update for it. Um, so instead of sending like a trigger command, what we have is you kind of have a timer um, that works with systemd. Basically, it fires once a day, um, and Podman is. Um, then told to like go check the registry if there's an updated container image. If there is, pull it down, recreate the uh, the container, recreate the service, um, and then uh, so that you have the updated image uh, running. Uh, but if in that process something fails, like um, the container doesn't come up, some other issue is happening, uh, rollback will detect that something has gone wrong. So it will roll back to the previous container image that was working um, to ensure that there's not really any disruption. And then when this happens, um, you can uh, whoever is uh, administrating those devices can go in and see what happened and then make a fix to the image, push another image up. And then since this happens frequently, like once a day kind of a thing, the next time the trigger happens, Pondman will go up to the registry, see that there's another update, pull that down, and then do the process again. Um, and then we also have uh, Podman restart service. Uh, so since Podman is daemonless, uh, there was really no good way of like, um, you know, restarting containers on reboot, which is a feature that Docker had with the restart always flag. Uh, so we have a, a service uh, that runs on a machine reboot, basically goes checks the Podman database to see which containers have the restart always uh, flag set. Uh, then it will um, go and re then Podman will uh, restart those containers basically on reboot. And um, we have a quick demo on this as well. Um, so here I'm going to run a quick uh, container to show that system D is running inside it. So um, this is just showing that we have system D running inside the container. Let me stop that really quickly because I need to get out of that. Right. Um, so this is just uh, a quick look at the generate system D help menu. We have a few flags and stuff that you can set. Uh, so now I'm going to create a container running top. And from that container, I'm going to use a general system D command to create a service file. And this is what the service file looks like. Um, you can see the exec start, exec stop has start, stop service, stop, stop service, et cetera. Um, so once I have the service file, so I can kind of, you know, if I need this, I can run it on boot, run it anytime I want with system CTL without having to, you know, do podman run, et cetera. So um, I reloaded um, my daemon and then for the CS, I have no containers running right now. So when I start the service, uh, you'll see that we have a container up and running, running that top command. And then when I stop the service, um, it will stop the service, it will stop the container and remove the container. And as you can see here, I have nothing running anymore. And this is just showing that you can also access the logs of that service. All right. Actually, sorry, it was muted. <laughs> so uh, Podman also has a recipe API um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with Podman Pi and Docker Pi. Um, so Podman uh, implements a Rust API um, and it kind of has two sides to it. Uh, they have a compat layer um, or and a uh, libpod layer. Um, so the compat layer is like uh, exactly one to one matches uh, Docker's Rust API and the uh, Podman the libpod layer is uh, kind of podman specific, so extra features that Docker may not have um, in, our, in our REST API. Uh, so this is, our REST API is really useful because also, it can also be um, integrated with systemd. So you can have socket activated uh, containers that um, are, and you could send the requests using our REST API. Um, so 
this also goes hand in hand with Podbean Pi and Docker Pi. Um, so Podbean Pi is a uh, Python SDK or a Python package, and they're bindings to Podbean's REST API. So if you're, uh, you know, a sysadmin who doesn't want to be sitting there writing like Podbean commands all day, you can actually script all your um, your whole uh, Podbean workflow using uh, Podbean Pi, and it just uses a REST API and it's just very elegant if you're a, a Python person. Um, so that's one of the like scripting features that we have uh, currently. All right. Um, and the next thing I'll talk about is the Compose support. Uh, so this came by popular demand um, support um, to make Podman work with Docker Compose. So Podman v3 and later works with Docker Compose. Initially, uh, it was only working with root and rootful mode, but recently we um, added support for rootless mode as well, kind of driving in our focus on security. Um, it's very simple. You just need to um, start the Podman socket and connect it uh, to the Docker Compose CLI. Um, so there's not much to say here. I'll just quickly show the demo for that. Um, so here I'm starting my Podman socket. Um, let's take a look at the Podman version. I'm using 4.0 right now. Um, to just to show that I'm not go I'm not actually using Docker and I'm using Podman. Um, you can see that my Docker um, service is currently inactive, and when we look at the Podman service, we can see that that's up and running. Um, so I'm going to run a quick container here using the Docker CLI, but I'm passing in the Podman socket as shown over here, um, and we can see here that uh, the container equals Podman means that this container was created with Podman. All right, uh, so this is a simple uh, compose file, um, just building a simple image and then running the sleep command on that. Uh, similar, just pass in the Podman socket as uh, shown here, and then do Docker compose up. And here we can see that the image was built, committed, and then um, the container and network was created um, from that. So my application is up and running. Uh, and we can see that with Podman VS. And similarly, when you're done with the compose and you want to um, bring it down, just run Docker compose down by pointing it to the Podman socket, and it will go through the service and like uh, stop the container, stop the network, and remove all of that. Which should happen anytime now. Yep. And then when we look at the Podman PS, we can see that uh, none of our containers are running anymore. Uh, so that was for compose. Um, one more big uh, feature we have is uh, running Podman inside a container. So if you attended Def Punk US last year, Dan, Dan and I gave a short talk on this. I'm not going to delve much um, deeply into this since you already gave a talk on it. Uh, but basically, um, Podman runs inside a Podman container, and Podman also runs in Kubernetes container. Uh, we wrote two blogs that highlight the different use cases of this, so running in rootful and rootless mode and privileged, unprivileged mode. Um, as well as running image builds uh, within the container. So if you're interested in this one, check it out. The links are here. We have also uploaded our slides to a sketch, uh, so you can also download from there and access all the links that are on our slides. Um, so one of the uh, biggest new features uh, that we have or that ha we have been working very hard on is Podman on non-Linux non OSs. If you remember from the beginning, uh, we said that Podman is a Linux native container uh, management tool. Um, so uh, it's very difficult to get things working on, you know, uh, a Mac or a Windows machine. Um, but uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we made it pretty easy uh, to be able to run stuff on Mac. Um, Currently, the workflow is kind of just brew install Podman. If you worked on a Mac before, you know that brew is the default package manager uh, or the de facto uh, package manager uh, for, uh, for Macs. Um, so you would install Podman. You do a Podman machine init, uh, a Podman machine start, and a Podman run Alpine. Um, so basically, two extra steps. You just say Podman machine init and then uh, Podman machine start. Um, and then you can use Podman however you would uh, on a Linux machine. Um, next slide. Uh, so I have a little demo. Um, so this is just uh, a recording of <laughs> my demo. Let's see if it'll play. Uh oh. Um. Oh no. Oh, there you go. Okay, so uh, you can see um, I'm first installing Podman, um, and it's just going to download it from Homebrew. Um, and 
uh, I'm just going to create a new machine, so pod me machine init, um, and that downloads uh, the machine a VM image, the default a VM image that we have, and you can see um, we're using Fedora Core S, extracting the compressed file. Um, and then, so now we have a machine. Um, now we're going to start our machine. Just wait for it to come up. And then now it's started. Now we can use Podbin like we would on Linux. So like you can forget about all the machine stuff. Uh, you can use however you want. So let's do a Podbin images. Um, I wrote a little web app using Flask. If you've ever done web development, you know that all it does is return, you know, a, a home page that says hello .com CZ. Um, I have a container file. Uh, which basically installs all the Flask requirements and then uh, copies everything into uh, the container and runs uh, Python, um, the Flask application. Um, so uh, and literally the same user experience as you would on Linux, um, you would just do a, a Podman build um, with this container file. Uh, tag it as Flask app because it, it's a Flask app, I guess. Um, and you can see it's pulling everything down. It feels like it's in Linux. You would never know it's in a machine. Um, takes a bit for it to build. And then uh, we can see that now we have our image with our uh, web app on it. So let's take that image and we're going to run it. Um, and if you know, by default, uh, Flask um, uh, hosts on uh, 5,000, but Mac has something weird with 5,000 where it has a default like thing list listening on 5,000, so I'm going to bind it to 8,000. Um, and if I just go to web browser and go to localhost 8,000, you can see hello devcom cc. Um, so the only two extra commands that you would need to type if you were on a Mac is, uh, you know, Pod machine in it and then Podman machine start and everything else it just feels the same uh, and we tried very very hard to make it uh, be like that um, <laughs> oh sorry I'm just trying to figure out how to make yep. this full screen again okay there you go okay uh, next slide uh oh it's playing again yeah there you go <laughs> um, so uh, this works on Intel or M1 so um, doesn't matter which one you have if you have a new Mac it's for you if you have an old Mac still for you uh, rootless and rootful you still don't need root privileges to run it on a Mac um, we're working on volume and networking support networking support is mostly there volumes um, it, it's 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 in progress and we're getting quite close to it. And we're also working on a GUI to manage machines. Um, so uh, the GUI written in Swift, you know, uh, Mac native, so it runs fast, it's lightweight, you don't have to deal with, um, what is it, Electron or uh, all like the heavyweight JavaScript like rendering engines, it's gonna be in, it's, it's in Swift. Um, and if we get to the next slide, um, here are some screenshots of our uh, work in progress uh, with the uh, GUI. You can see you can like create new VMs on it. Um, and then if you've worked on a Mac before, you know there's like a little system bar. Um, so you can just manage your machines from the system bar. Uh, if you've ever used Docker on a Mac, it, it feels kind of like that where you just like press the button and it, it brings the machine up. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I've talked a lot about machine. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so how does it actually work? So um, you, if you're not familiar with how containerization works on non Linux OSs, you might be like, oh, why, why, why do we have a machine? What, what is this machine about? Um, so as we said that uh, Podman is Linux native and so are all containers. So when you run uh, containers on non Linux OSs, you have to have a, a, a Linux distribution running it. Um, so this means that everything will be running in a VM. And in this case, we choose Fedora Core OS uh, as our OS to run inside of the VM. This is not a quirk of Podman. Um, again, containers are Linux. Like fundamentally, like if you have a container, it will be running on Linux. So any other container engine um, that 
runs on a Mac is also running on a virtual machine. Um, but we're quite transparent about like, you know, pod machine up, like we're, built, we're bringing up a Linux virtual machine to run Podman in. Um, so the technology behind this is we're using QMU plus HVF acceleration to run our virtualized native distribution. Um, and uh, so that's kind of like our infrastructure. And then inside QMU, we're running Fedora Core S. So that's our uh, Linux distribution. Um, in order to bring up Fedora Core S, we use Ignition. Um, it's just kind of this file that uh, kind of sets up everything in Fedora Core S for us to use um, uh, Podbean in. Um, GVars or TapSoc, uh, Tap VSOC is a proxy application. Um, so in my demo, you can see that I bound uh, port 5000 to uh, inside the container um, to port 8000 on my Mac. Um, on a Linux machine, this is just one-to-one, -one, right? You're binding 5,000 to 8,000. Um, but on a Mac, it's a little more complicated because you have to take the container port, port and then bind it to the host VM port or the VM port, and then you have to bind it to like your host port. Um, so GVisor Tops VSOC is just this application that handles all this like kind of um, mapping from inside the container to the VM to your host machine. Um, and then SSH uh, is uh, how we uh, connect to the Linux VM. Um, so uh, fairly secure. Um, and yeah, so uh, the default virtualized uh, distribution is Fedora Core S. Um, we allow people to use their own uh, distribution if they would like, but it, there's a lot of setup that needs to be done uh, manually if you do choose to do so. Um, so you're not locked in, but Fedora Core S makes it easy if like you don't want to think about everything, you just want everything to work, um, which is you know our goal um, is just to make everything easy and feel like native on Linux. Um, so we're also that that's kind of the Mac side where we're using QMU. Uh, we're also doing some work on Podman on Windows. Um, if you've worked on Windows before, you know uh, there's this feature called uh, WSL or Windows Subsystem for Linux. Um, basically, you can run uh, Linux inside your uh, Windows box, and this is supported by Microsoft, like ships with Windows and stuff like that. Um, beforehand, we would recommend you that like you would just run Podman on WSL and, and pretend it's just on that. Um, but we're looking to uh, implement the same uh, kind of feel that Podman on Mac has on Podman on Windows, except for um, not we're not going to be using uh, QMU as the VM. We're just going to be using WSL. So uh, the idea behind this is that you have the Podman client connecting to uh, Podman running in WSL instead of on the Mac. You have a Podman client connecting to um, Podman running on uh, QMU. Um, and a lot of work is being done on this uh, place. Um, on WSL, yes. So if you just decide to run Podman on WSL, like you don't have to worry about all of this. This is for people who want to be um, who want to use Podman from the Windows side and connect it to a WSL backend. If you just want to uh, tinker around with it in WSL, it should work perfectly. Um, so lots of exciting uh, news uh, and uh, we're kind of reaching out, branching out to uh, welcome the people who don't primarily develop on Linux um, to, you know, come and try Podman and, and see how great it is. Okay. Uh, so some upcoming work on Podman. Um, we've also been working really hard on uh, build kit support. So if you uh, have used Docker before, um, Docker has kind of this extended build feature called build kit, uh, which um, allows, there's just more features that you can put in your build. Um, and one of the big uh, things we've worked on this year is build kit support. So adding stuff like SSH secret mounts or SSH secret mounts cache tempfs. Um, these are all like on the category of run mounts. So uh, if you've heard me talk before, I talk a lot about Podman secrets because I worked a lot on Podman secrets. Um, it's kind of the build side to Podman secrets where if you want data inside your build, but don't want it in your image, um, or if you want data inside only one stage of your build and don't want it to expose it to other uh, stages of your build, um, you would use uh, these kind of build kit features. So we've implemented a lot of these and we want to continue uh, taking more uh, build kit features and putting them into Podman and Builda. Yeah, and another, um... Thing that's happening pretty soon in Podman's future is uh, we're having a major version bump from 3.x to 4.x. 
um, there's been a lot of new features, a lot of bug fix, a lot of changes in 4.0. If you take a look at our, um, we started cutting release candidates. And if you do take a look at the notes for a release candidate too, for example, you'll see it's pages and pages long. There, there's a lot of stuff that's gone in. Uh, one of the biggest thing that we did was uh, created a new uh, networking stack for Podman called Netavark. Um, so this is to help um, you know close the gap in the networking, um, the gap we had in our networking, and to be able to add more features. Like one of the big one is uh, IPv6 support. Um, so that's something to look forward to. <laughs> Um, all right, so here are some resources. Um, these are the links to our GitHub uh, repos. Um, one of the, uh, I guess one, one thing that might interest you is the demos repo. This has a lot of scripts for all the demos that we've done in the past, including the demos for this talk. Um, we also have um, our websites, uh, Pondo.io, Builder.io, Cryo.io, and um, the team and community uh, are Hangout and IRC and Libra.chat under the Pound Podman um, channel. So if you want to just come say hi or have any issues or want to talk about Podman, feel free to you know drop uh, drop by in there. Uh, we also have our two Twitter handles for Podman and Builder. We use these to kind of send out announcements um, related to um, the tools and like uh, when we're having our community meetings. So um, we have one community meeting every two months, which is kind of demos on what's new in Podman from the team and the community. And then we have a community cabal meeting, which is a meeting for technical discussions with the team and the community that happens once every month. Um, so we um, send out reminders to the Twitter channel as well, so to our Twitter um, channels as well as um, our mailing list. And um, all those meetings are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you couldn't make one of them, you can always go back and listen on um, what was happening. Uh, and as always, we are looking for you know contributors. Um, please download Podman, play around Podman if you have any issues, open issues. If you have a fix for it, even better, open a PR to fix it. Um, but we're always looking for new faces and new ideas and how to you know make Podman better for everyone. Um, that's all for our talk. Thank you. Uh, questions. Uh, I think we have two questions in the Q and A. Um, the first one is, "What about Podman and Minikube?" Um, it, the Minikube link refers to maturity, uh, which might mean that what Minikube wants to do with it is this on Podman's radar. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I'll mention it again, um, we have uploaded our slides um, on SCED. So and we have a lot of links. So if you go get, grab the slides from there, you can access all of them. Uh, where can we read more about Netavark? Um, our Netavark repo is on containers slash Netavark, so github.com slash containers slash Netavark. Um, I don't know, I think Brent is grabbing a link uh, if you want to read more about it, um, but uh, it's our new network stack. It's written in Rust. Um, it's, you know, lots of work still being done, but uh, it like it, it's, it's brand spanking new, and I think uh, it does a lot better than what we currently have. Mm -hmm. Um uh Arushi, do you know the answer to the uh, mini cube question? Where is that? I, it's I was in the QA tab. tab. It's in the oh. QA tab. Um I actually do not have an answer to that, but we can get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh feel free to like send an email yeah. on the email list or, or um, hop into IRC and ask this question that <laughs> we perhaps do not know the answer to at the current moment. Um, and then another question is, a lot of server apps have a Docker and Compose solution, and it's not that simple to migrate that to system view services. Is it recommended to use Pod and Compose and then generate a system view unit from that? So we do have Docker Compose support with Podman. If you want to use Podman, as I showed, you can use the Podman socket to point to it and still have that running. Um, in terms of generating to system D, I don't have a strong answer on that. You can try it and see if that works. 
I've never tried it, so I am not exactly sure. But if anyone from our team who's watching and has an answer, please put it in the chat. <laughs> um, um, and uh, I think earlier we said that uh, we're gearing up for Podman 4 release uh, soon. Um, we have a bunch of RCs out right now, and if you're interested in using it um, and testing out our shiny new network stack called Netavark uh, with it, um, please uh, please feel free to, um, to you know take a look at it and like give us feedback on on what's happening with uh, 4.0. Uh, we would love to like you know have as many users try to use it uh, before we uh, actually release it to the wild. Um, yeah. Oh, and Brent put in a link to a blog for Compose Kubernetes Podman that might have some more insight to that question. <laughs> There's one more question. I think it's for you, Ashley. Will you be working on the GUI for Windows as well as Mac? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it, it depends on if I can convince myself to use a Windows machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I've, I've done work on Macs and I've done work on Linux, but I, I've literally never programmed a single line on a Windows machine. So if I can wrap my head around that, I will be uh, I, I, I personally will be working on it, but um, we we are also, go, like in theory, uh, we are going to be working on a Windows GUI. Um, whether it be from the community or me, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, that's that's the roadmap. Our roadmap that kind of is everything that happens on a, a Windows machine should feel the same as a Mac machine. Um, so we're kind of, like the idea is it's like, we want everything to feel like uh, Linux. And if it's not Linux, we want the not Linux things to feel like each other as well. So everything should be equally balanced in, in terms of, um, you know, like what what features we have. So whether you're on Windows, Linux, or Mac, um, you should not be left out. Uh, of, and you should not be deprived of a Podman experience. So uh, yes, um, we should be working on a, on a Windows uh, GUI. Another question, uh, any progress on integrated Quadlet Podman for generating system view units to start containers on boot? It is It is on the roadmap. Um, it will it's there in the future. I don't think any work has started on it, but it is um, in the plan. Um, and then is Podman fully supported on RHEL auto update and for containers in production? Um, Dan, how about you answer the question you asked? <laughs> um, uh, I think it is. I don't fully remember, but our, um, I think it is supported on RHEL right now. Please correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. <laughs> um, another yes, question. The answer is yes. Oh, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> um, another question is, uh, any chance of RC pre-built binaries for Mac OS and Windows? Um, do you mean, uh, so we typically don't uh, build binaries for RCs, um, but uh, there's also, it's, it's also kind of difficult for Mac and Windows, um, mostly because uh, you would need, you wouldn't just need a client binary, you would need to match the uh, version of Podman that's inside your VM. So you would end up needing to build a, a custom um, VM image with the newest uh, RC Podman. Um, and we cut RCs like more frequently, like when we're gearing up, it's it's not like we don't spend a, like, you know, a week or we don't spend a lot of time in between RCs. So um, it's kind of hard to, to keep updating uh, stuff in between RCs um, and 
building like, you know, we not only have to build a binary, we have to build like two binaries and a VM image. Um, and it's just a lot. Uh, but if you ask somebody uh, nicely on our team, perhaps we can make that, uh, we can link you to something. Um, but uh, yeah, not, not typically, it's not something we typically do, but if you're really interested in it, just, you know, reach out to one of us. Yeah, we basically cut RCs every week um, mm -hmm. while we're going towards the release. Yeah. So kind of a balancing act of like <laughs> doing five different things at the mm -hmm. same time, RC weeks or release weeks. I think questions have slowed down or stopped. Um, if you have further questions, you can find us in IRC uh, or our mailing list. So, oh, I think there's one more. <laughs> will there be a Podman desktop and will we charge like other companies? There will be a Podman desktop and no, it will be completely free. Um, yes. You know, uh, we're. The, the idea with the GUI, um, the screenshots I showed with the GUI um, is that it would manage uh, your machine first. And then if we can get uh, like managing containers into it, um, we would see like integration with like container management with the GUI um, and it will be free. And uh, we will package it as, you know, a DMG. If you worked on a Mac, uh, everything works kind of as a DMG, um, yeah. Uh, trying to get as native as possible with our uh, Mac technology over here. Any other questions? Well, I don't see any questions here in the chat, but it was really a great presentation. Thanks to uh, our speakers, Urvashi and Ashley, and thanks for the thanks thanks to the amazing audience for being here. Yeah. All right, thank you all very much, and we're in IRC. If you have further questions, so please feel free to reach out. Yeah, feel free to reach out.